the screen popped up sermon and Lima hopped up here. I said, well, I got the morning off. I'll just sit down. Yeah. I love Lima and love the work that he's doing here. And brethren, I love that he is an Islander and that he is here working with, with you. You know, you, you know that you have a, a cross-cultural congregation. It will always be that way. You are between the U.S. and the islands, and you are the islands, and it's good that he is an islander. He, he can relate to that. Because of our time in, the, in Micronesia, I understand the great value that there is in that. And uh, some people are more relational and some people are less relational. Some preachers do, do uh, their strength is working with people and some preachers, their strength is, is studying in the office. And, and there's a balance to all of those. No one's terrible at, at either of them. But Lima excels at working with people and Islanders are that way. They're more family oriented and get together in groups and have their big meals together. And I love that. And I love that you have a minister who is skilled for that. I think it's a perfect fit. We have been to the macadamia nut farm. We cracked our own macadamia nuts out of the shells. We have been uh, to Boots and Chemo's over there for the banana pancakes with a macadamia nut sauce. I was very sad that they don't bottle that so we could take it home. I did a lot of research trying to find where I could buy bottled macadamia nut sauce. Cannot find it anywhere. I don't think anybody bottles it. Okay. And then we went to Island Vintage Coffee, right? Because we think that's the best coffee in the world. And that's one of our main things. So this is what we've been doing. And notice it all centers on food, right? That's right. Because we know you have some of the best things here. And brethren, we love it. We love your island. So it's so good to be able to be with you. The highlight of Honolulu is this congregation, is the Church of Christ in, in, on the island. That's the best part of uh, of Hawaii. There was a self-help book written in 1939, and the principles of that book are still very valuable today. Some of them are commit to learning, 1936, commit to learning. We always want to, to continue learning, don't we? Never want to say that we know it all or that we've arrived because there's more to learn. And the more we know, the more we're able to do. That's true biblically. And it's true just in general life as well. Another principle is to learn from our mistakes. Some people don't. And they commit the same mistakes over and over again. That's a shame. I want to learn from my mistakes and the mistakes of others so that I can have less pain in life by committing mistakes. Another one is to be a good listener. And that is a valuable part of working with people, no matter what the subject matter is, especially in talking about the Bible. It's good to listen. Listen to people. Don't forget to smile. Stateside is different than here on this subject, I think. I know it's different in Guam because in Guam, the young people who work in the fast food restaurants are still taught to have a, a high level of uh, politeness to even strangers. That is not so much true stateside because every time we go through a fast food restaurant drive through they'll hand you the food, not smile, not say anything sometimes, just hand it to you. And I want to say, Dale Carnegie says, don't forget to smile. Another one is don't criticize, condemn, or complain. The name of this book is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And brethren, these principles still are very valuable for us today. And this one, this one in particular, don't criticize, condemn, or complain, is powerful. He doesn't say never. He makes this point in the book that he doesn't say never do it because there may be a time. But generally speaking, it's good not to criticize, condemn, or complain. I know a man who, who criticizes his wife constantly. And he'll, he'll, he'll do it by saying something like, well, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you, what, did you not think about this or think about that? Or why didn't you cook it, cook it this way? Or, or, you know, it would have been a little better if you had, and brethren, maybe it's 50 to a hundred times a day. And, and around him, she is a wilted flower. And I hate that. And I want to say to him, what if you never criticized her? Because apart from him, away from him, she's industrious. She's smart. She's a hard worker. She, she's great. But around him, that, 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 that brings her down. But if he never criticized her, you know what she'd do? She'd be that way around him. And he would be blessed by her personality and her abilities if he would not do that. 
And so it makes sense to me that Dale Carnegie says, don't criticize. Usually, when someone criticizes another person, the criticism is not received the way the criticizer intends it to be. To the criticizer, it's a small thing. To the one who is criticized, it's a big thing, right? Well, the children of Israel weren't guilty of the criticizing so much as they were guilty of the complaining. And brethren, they did so in the Old Testament. They needed this book as well. In Exodus 15, 22 and 24, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And the people complained against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Uh, just three days in, and brethren, they were already complaining. In, in Exodus 16, 3, we have, and the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, brethren, where were they at mentally to say to Moses, we would rather have died in Egypt than be here with you now. How, how much of a complaint is that? And not the only time they say it. Exodus 17, 3, and the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why is it you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And this is where Moses is told to strike the rock and God brings forth water from them. And so Moses calls that place Massa, tempted and Meribah contention so they were not they were not strangers to complaining and as our scripture reader read for us in numbers 21 verses 4 through 9 there they do it again and this time God responds with a punishment so let's look at these verses together numbers 21 verse 4 and they journeyed <clears throat> from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the soul of the people became very discouraged along the way. So they were not given permission to go through Edom. Brethren, it would have saved them a lot of time and a lot of hassle to have gone through Edom. But they ask and the answer was no. In fact, they, they ask again. And this time Edom said no by bringing out their army and, and presenting it that way. This is the land <clears throat> that they were traveling through in the wilderness. And brethren, they had their families with them. They had all of their goods with them. They had their livestock with them. And so this large group of people was traveling in this largely desert kind of place. And, and then to be denied passage, all they wanted to do, they said, was to just to walk through. We won't take anything. We'll just walk through. And the answer was no. And so they had to increase the distance by which they were, they were traveling because of that answer. And they brought the army out and said no. And so that's why, brethren, that's why the soul of the people became discouraged on the way. You and I would be in the same boat. Hopefully we would not complain against God and, and Moses like they did, but we would be discouraged. It would be disheartening, to say the least, to have to do all of that travel with all of our families and goods and uh, have, have it added, added to that way. So then it brings us to verse five. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now, wait a minute. They just said there's no food. And then they said, well, there's bread, but this is worthless bread and we don't want this bread anymore. Well, they, they had the manna, didn't they? They had the manna. So there wasn't no food. It's just they didn't like what it is that they, that they had. You know, God very strongly in the New Testament tells us to be thankful for many things, for everything we have received, but particularly for our food. God says, be thankful. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3, and then verses 4 and 5, now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. He's given a bullet list, bullet point list of things that they're doing wrong. Verse three, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving 
by those who believe and know by those who believe and know the truth. And then verses four and five, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Three times in these verses, he says, be thankful for our food. Sometimes someone will say, well, why, why do you pray before your meal? This is why. This is why, because we understand that all of the food that we have been given comes from God. And so I got this at the supermarket. Well, it, it comes from God. I got this because I worked for the money. It all comes from God. God made it all and God has provided it to us. And so we will be thankful for, for that food. The children of Israel were not. God gave them free bread, free manna, and at times gave them water and gave them quail. But here they were unthankful for it and complained against Moses and against God. And then that brings us to verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. And, and, and sometimes somebody will, will ask a question and they'll say, why is the God of the New Testament different from the God of the Old Testament? And they'll cite something like this and they'll say, God in the Old Testament was mean and he just wanted to hurt people and to punish people. But that's not true. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. You know, brethren, if, if, if we had a, a, a member of our family get hurt, by somebody else and it was a, a legal issue and we, we we sued and took that person to court we would expect the judge to give a just answer to that now sometimes sometimes the judge may be a very lenient and then the offended family will say he was not just he was not fair we deserve justice for our family member that got hurt we expect a judge to be fair and to give out a harsh punishment when it's the right time to do so that's our God of the Old Testament. He gave punishments, brethren, but he always did it when it was the right time to do so. We see how many times the children of Israel complained severely against God. And in this case, they were doing it too. So, so it was right for God to punish them. It was fair and just for God to punish them. God's always fair in all of his works. And, and the difference between you and me and God is that God knows the hearts of people. In Luke 16, 15, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. Romans 8, 27, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is. Hebrews 4, 12, God's word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's right. So God, God knows their hearts. As, as bad as their words were, I wonder what their hearts looked like to God. Romans 9, 20, but indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Brethren, we are nowhere on the mental level to be able to argue against God. It didn't work for Job. Job wanted, Job wanted the, 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 the question answered, why? That's all. He wasn't blaming God. He just wanted the answer, why? And, and God's answer to Job was, you're not even able to, to, to question that, to ask that. And we know that our God loves us so much that he sent his own son, a part of the Godhead, to be, to be living on the earth and then to die a horrible death. Why? To pay the price for our sins. God loves us. God blesses us. God answers our prayers. God gives to us. And so for us to, for anyone to come and blame God, oh no, they, 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 don't, they don't understand the first thing about our God. We love him. He loves us. And, and, and that's enough. So when he gives a, a punishment, brethren, it's justice and it's right. And so when he gives the, the, the fiery serpents among these people, it's justice and it's right. So then as we look to the, the snakes in verse six, and, and the text says that they were fiery. How about that? Many things in this passage make me scratch my head and, and ask a question, and this is one of them. Brethren, were they on fire, or were they the, were they the color of fire? You know, as we ask that, let, let, let's first ask, if God wanted to make them on fire, could he have done so? Would that be possible for God? Well, yeah. In Exodus 3, verse 2, with Moses, he made a bush that was on fire, and brethren, the bush was never consumed. 
we went through recently went through a uh, uh, the Bible Museum in Washington D.C. and they had illustrations and they had a, a burning bush and at the end of that illustration the bush was consumed it was burned up and and black branches left there and I said that's not right because Moses's bush was on fire but never consumed. Our God has all control over fire. He can make something on fire and not, not burn up all the way. You know, the, the, the bombardier beetle, which we have on the earth today, mixes gases and sprays out something that's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Our God knows how to work with heat and fire. Mine and your bodies produce three different flammable gases. Oxygen, hydrogen, and methane. It's a wonder we don't just explode, right? Well, because our God knows how to make things. Our God knows how to make fire. And so if he wanted to, he can make these, make these snakes on fire. In verses 8 and 9, however, we read what Moses did when God told him to make a fiery serpent and put it on a pole. And so for this reason, I believe the snakes were not on fire, but they were the color of fire, because listen to what he said here. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. Okay, there's the instruction. Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, the color of fire, as close as you can get with a metal and put it on a pole. And so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, Moses could have dipped it in oil and set it on fire, uh, but the text doesn't say that he did that. Moses' answer to make a fiery serpent was to make one the color of fire. You know, brethren, if the snakes had been on fire, then maybe all of the camp of Israel would have burned down, and, and the text doesn't say that. If the snakes had been on fire, then maybe they would have seen them and, and heard them and been able to avoid them. You know, the, the advantage of a snake is that it's hidden. If it's inside the house, it'll go under a bed or, or in a closet. If it's outside, it'll go under a bush. A snake is hidden until you're right, on, right up on top of it. But if they were on fire, then they, they, would, they would have been seen. I know a lady in Florida who had a snake in her car and she was sitting in the driver's seat and, and the snake was at her feet. And she, she was petrified of snakes, terrified of snakes. And the snake went up under the, the instrument panel up behind the, the brake pedal, went up into that area. And she jumped out of the car and ran inside the house and told her husband, there's a snake in the car. You've got to go get the snake out of the car. And so he went out there and tried to find the snake and, and could not find the snake. He said, honey, I think the snake is gone. She said, I'm not driving that car till you get that snake out of that car. And then maybe uh, six hours later, honey, that snake is, is gone. They, they don't stay in a car for that, that long. She said, I'm not driving that car until you can verify that it has left the car. And he never could. And they sold that car. That's right. That's right. And so a snake's advantage is that it's hidden. But if they were literally on fire, then brethren, they, they, they would not be. But if you were to say, well, what color are they? And they are red and, and, and orange and yellow. You might say, well, they're fiery. It's a fiery snake. And, and that would make sense. But brethren, what kind of snakes were these anyway? We don't know exactly what kind of snake it was. But if we were to get a get an idea of how deadly the snake bite might have been, maybe we can look at the, one of the most deadly snakes in the world today and, and compare it. Let's look at the black mamba from Africa. They are not in the United States except in zoos, so you don't have to worry about this snake being, being out. But uh, brethren, the black mamba is not black, and it is in Africa. They are eight feet long and can move at 12 miles per hour. The average human can run seven miles per hour. So brethren, they are longer and faster than we are. Not good, not good. Death can result from two drops of its venom and an adult snake carries 20 drops in its fangs. When bitten by a black mamba without the antidote, one loses the ability to talk in 20 minutes. Collapse occurs in 45 minutes. A, per a person becomes comatose in one hour. And then the end usually comes in about six hours. So I wonder, because I wonder how much time they had to go in to look at the bronze serpent that Moses made after one of them was bit by a snake. 
If I were in the camp of Israel and these snakes were out and on the loose and that was the instruction, I would want to know that the road is open. My camel is ready. If my daughter gets bitten by a snake, I know where we're going. I'd be telling my fellow Israelites, you keep the road clear because we may have to beeline it for the tabernacle, the center of camp, and go look at that snake. They would have had maybe 30 minutes before they would not be able to move on their own in order to, in order to get there. So that brings us then to verse 7 in our text. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Finally, we have their repentance, yeah? This is what we would have hoped to have seen in the very beginning. And there's another principle from our self-help book from 1936. When you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. Men, if you want to know how to solve the problem with the woman after the problem has started, this is how. This is it. And the problem comes along, she gets mad. If we will admit it quickly and emphatically, that will diffuse it as, as fast as possible. Honey, I'm sorry I was wrong. I realized that, that what I said hurt your feelings. I realized that it has set you off and made you mad for the last three hours. And I want you to know that I'm really sorry. And I will, I will uh, put it in my thinking not to do that again. Now, some men hear me say that and they'll say, I'm not saying that. If I grunt, I'm sorry, that's enough. But if you do, then she feels compelled to let you know that set me off for the next three hours or that's something that really hurt my heart and you're going to have to go through that. But if you'll follow Dale Carnegie's advice and admit it quickly and emphatically, it'll help it get to where it needs to be as fast as possible. These Israelites would have done well to have done this in the very beginning, to admit that they were wrong quickly and emphatically and get past it and through it. And so then it brings us to what we just read a moment ago, verses eight and nine. Moses makes the bronze serpent and, and, and puts it on a pole. And brethren, it's bronze. And that's brass plus zinc. And it's harder than brass alone. And there was a bronze, bronze age in antiquity. Our history books tell us it was between 3300 BC to about 1200 BC. And that fits actually with the Bible's timeline. In Genesis 4.22, Zillah bore Tubal Cain, an instruction and instructor in every craftsman in bronze and iron. So very early, Genesis chapter 4, the people were skilled at working with bronze. By Numbers 21, no problem at all. And so they had the ability to work with that bronze. And, and all the people had to do was to look at it to be healed from the snake bite. But brethren, how far away was it? And you say, look at it, but, but would they be able to look at it or would they have to jump on the camel and, and start riding? How, how big was the camp? How far could they see? Well, in, in Numbers, we're in Numbers 21 and in Numbers chapter one, we have a census of the people and there were 603,550 fighting men above the age of 20, 600,000 600, fighting men. And if you give to each man a wife and, and two children, they probably had more, then you're looking at a population of the camp of Israel, conservative estimate, of 2.4 million people. And so they were to camp, as the illustration that you see here, they were to camp in their, in their tribes around the tabernacle, something similar to this. 2.4 million, million people. If you put one family to an acre, because they had their livestock and they had their whole family with them, then uh, you're looking at about 400,000 acres. Divide that by 12, and each of these colored squares would be about 33,000 acres. The side of one of those squares would be 182 acres long, or seven miles. So the side of one of those squares for the tribes would be seven miles long. Well, could they see that far? Could they see that far if you're on the outside of the camp? Were they fighting to see who could get to the closest inside of the camp? Well, we can see 3.1 miles, but that limitation only exists because of the curvature of the earth. When there's clear line of sight, we can see much further. A friend of mine said that they can see the St. Louis Arch. I live in St. Louis, and the St. Louis Arch, they can see it 15 miles outside of the city. Someone did an experiment where they said they could see the flame of a candle at 30 miles away with clear line of sight. The moon is 238,000 miles away. 
So as long as there's clear line of sight and the object is big enough, brethren, we can really see almost indefinitely. Seven miles with line of sight, no, no problem. And if Moses had it up on a pole like he was told to do, then they could see that thing. So if they were bitten, they could go outside and look and should be able to see the broad serpent. Well, brethren, what does this passage mean for us? Number one, they had to look at it. We know in Romans 15, 4, that the things which are written before were written for our hope. And, and, and that, that makes sense because we have to look to Jesus. They had to look at the snake. We have to look at Jesus in 1 Corinthians 10, 9. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. Direct reference to our passage. Brethren, we have to look to Christ. We understand that we're, we're not going to worship the snake. You know what those Israelites did? They kept that snake, they named it Neshutan, and they started worshiping it like an idol. Good King Hezekiah came and broke it up so that they would not be able to do so. Some people today want to worship Satan. They think in terms of the Greek gods, where people used to pick their favorite god, maybe God of Harvest, and they'd worship that one, thinking that that god would bless their harvest, and they, they take that thinking and, and apply it to Satan today. And they think, well, if we worship Satan, we'll be his people and he'll bless us. He won't. The devil has no interest in humanity except to use us to hurt God. God want, uh, Satan wants to hurt God, and he tempts us and makes us sin so that, so that he can hurt God more. That's the only interest that Satan has. So when they worship him, brethren, it's, it's, it's a joke on them. And then we come to the main reference in the New Testament to our passage, John 3, 14, and the Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And this is right before a reference to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world passage. Brethren, our passage introduces that verse. And in John 12, 32, it said this way, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. That's the, that's the, the message right there. That's the story. Jesus was lifted up on the cross like that bronze serpent was lifted up on a pole. And if we will look to him, well, we have eternal life, brethren, and overcome all those tactics of the devil. Jesus said, I will draw all men to myself. There's the love of God. He wants everybody drawn to him, not one of them lost, everybody to come to him. But in order to do that, we've got to overcome the temptations of the devil. Revelation 12, 9 says it well. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Brethren, there, there, there's a war between God and, and the devil and God's followers and, and the devil's followers. And, and the devil is already on the losing side. That's what's funny about this war is it's already been won. When Jesus died on the cross and, and rose from the dead, brethren, he, he defeated death and defeated everything to do with the devil. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, death is swallowed up in victory. But the devil wants to go down swinging. And he's going to be falling down. And he wants to grab your foot and bring you down with him. And the way that he does that is by offering you anything that, that you might want that might be against God. He tempts us and just wants to make us stumble. We are pawns in the battle used to hurt God. And so whenever that temptation comes along that's difficult to deal with, it's good for us if we can remember that we're going to be looking to Jesus. We're, we're going to be looking to him on the cross for our strength and for our ability to say no to the devil and we're not going to let the devil put us on his side. No matter what it is he has to offer, no matter how, how wonderful it may seem at the time, it's always, that worm has always got a hook in it. So let us say no to him whenever the temptation comes along and let us march right into heaven with our God, looking to Jesus. This morning, if you believe Jesus is the son of God, willing to repent of your past sins and confess his name before men, you can be baptized, have your sins washed away, and be on that road to heaven with this church. If you have that desire or any need at all, why don't you come right now as we stand and sing.